Hello, everyone, and welcome to the VWVRC Foundation's Oral History Project. The goal of this project is to capture and preserve significant events and their associated stories from the VAWVRC community's illustrious history and make them available to the community and the general public. I'm Joe McNamara of the VAWVRC Foundation, and it's my honor to introduce today's presenter, Commander Mark Fellows, United States Navy, retired. Mark is going to describe the conduct of Operation Praying Mantis from his standpoint as a mission commander flying the E2C Hawkeye during the operation. About our narrator, Mark Fellows was born in Chicago, attended Edinburgh College and reported to Aviation Officer Candidate School in July 1969. He was commissioned in December of 69 and earned his wings of gold in April 71. Mark had two Vietnam cruises aboard USS Hancock flying the E1B, also known as the Willie Fudd. After a short tour at BT-31 as a multi-engine flight instructor, he transitioned to the E-2B Hawkeye. Department head tours followed at VAW-111, RVAW-110, and VAW-112, deploying on USS Ranger, USS Enterprise, and USS Constellation. Mark transitioned to the E-2C aircraft in 1983. He served as the XOCL of VAW-117 from 1985 until 1988. After a tour on a deployed battle group staff, he retired as a commander with over 6,000 flight hours and over 600 traps. Post-Navy, he flew with American Airlines as a pilot, accumulating 10,000 flight hours in the 757, 767, and MD-80 aircraft. Mark, we're really looking forward to your account. Over to you. Well, thank you, Joe. At the beginning of 1988, during my command tour with VW-117, we were attached to Carrier Wing 11 aboard the USS Enterprise and part of Battle Group Foxtrot. We were operating in the northern Gulf of Oman, better known as Gonzo Station to many of our sailors, taking our turn in the American carrier rotation in support of Operation Earnest Will, the escorting of the reflagged Kuwaiti tankers through the Persian Gulf during the Iran-Iraq War. While we were there, we participated in another operation Praying Manus, which involved United States retaliatory strikes against the country of Iran for the mining of the Persian Gulf and the subsequent mine damage done to one of our frigates. I'd like to provide an overview of our squadron's partic participation in Praying Manus, but I think first we need to review the events behind how the United States Navy became involved in that Middle East war. In September 1980, Iraqi troops under Saddam Hussein invaded Iran in what was to become known as the Iran-Iraq War. It was a particularly gruesome war, as wars go, resulting in over a million lives lost. Lasting eight years, it was one of the longer wars of the 20th century. War costs to both countries were substantial, at a, over 400 billion in damages. Much of that, being due to the destruction of each other's oil infrastructure. Neither side had any qualms about enlisting children into their armies. The land war quickly stagnated into a standoff resembling the trench warfare in World War I with human wave and gas attacks. Looking for new avenues to attack their adversary, they turned to attacking each other's shipping in the Persian Gulf. This became known as the tanker war. Iraq preferred to use its aircraft in attacks flying their French Super Enfendars and Mirage F-1s equipped with Exocet missiles. They would fly a very predictable route down the center of the Persian Gulf, looking for targets of opportunity. And in 1987, one of our frigates, the USS Stark, was hit by two Exocet missiles fired by an Iraqi mirage. Unfortunately, 37 U.S. sailors were killed as a result. Iraq claimed a case of mistaken identity, and the United States accepted that claim. Iran, on the other hand, used its ships to attack shipping. They had several frigates manned by Iran's regular navy and operating out of Bandar Abbas Harbor. They also used small speedboats called Boghammers, and by Iran's fanatical Revolutionary Guard. 
They operated from several small islands in the Gulf, Farsi Island in the northern Persian Gulf, and Abu Masa, closer to the Straits of Hormuz. They tended to use light weapons, machine guns, and RPG, rocket propelled grenades, in swarm attacks, shooting out the ship's bridge and crew areas. Early in the war, Iran designated an exclusion zone to protect their own shipping and tended to attack almost anybody else entering the zone. They also required that all shipping passing through the Straits of Hormuz provide a two-day notice with country of origin, load manifest, and destination. Iran had stopped and inspected over 1,500 ships confiscated, uh, 34 of them by the war's end. Many ships refused to comply with Iran's inspection requirement and would try to slip through the straits. As a result, Iran positioned revolutionary guards on three oil platforms near the straits to act as spotters, relaying information of non-compliant ships back to Bandar Abbas for interception by Iran's naval forces. Majority of uh, Iran's ship attack occurred in the areas that you see highlighted in red here. And in early 1987, Iran resorted to laying mines across the convoy routes in the Gulf. By war's end, over 520 ships had been attacked by both sides. During the Shah of Iran's reign, he had purchased four Vosper Class V frigates from Great Britain. Only two, though, were operational during the war, the Sabalon and the Seham. Both had rather unsavory reputations, but the Sabalon was by far the worst. Its captain would order a ship to stop, then board with his crew for an inspection. He would often sit down and have lunch with the crew, talking to the tanker crew. Once he and his men departed, he would call up over the radio, thank them for lunch, and end the transmission with, have a nice day, and then open up fire on the ship. He was awarded the nickname Captain Nasty by our U.S. sailors. In December 1986, Kuwait requested United States support for their tankers. Neither the government nor the Pentagon wanted anything to do with that war. Our minds were quickly changed when they found out that the Soviet Union had already agreed to reflag three Kuwaiti tankers. So in March 1987, the United States agreed to reflag and escort 11 Kuwaiti tankers in the Persian Gulf. Those ships were renamed. They flew the American flag and had U.S. Merchant Marine Masters in charge. That operation was called Ernest Will. 24 July 1987, U.S. escort operations started with three U.S. combatants, the Fox, the Kid, and the Kremlin, providing escort support for two reflag Kuwaiti tankers, the Gas Prince and the Bridgeton, for the 500-mile journey. Things did not go well. At the end of the first day of the convoy, Bridgeton strikes a mine. Her master said it was like a 500-pound sledgehammer hitting the bow. And with a 30 by 15 foot hole in a Bridgeton's outer hull, the convoy continued. However, all U.S. escorts now decided to move behind the Bridgeton for the remainder of the voyage. USS Constellation, Ranger, Midway, Enterprise, Vinson, and Nimitz all participated in Ernest Will operations. USS Enterprise replaced the Midway in the Gulf of Oman, February 1988. Carrier Air Wing 11 started its first Ernest Will operation 24 March. I was airborne in our E-2 during the start of that mission, along with two F-14 fighters. Convoys preferred to transit the Straits of Hormuz at night for obvious reasons. So it was about 2 a.m. in the morning when an Iranian F-4 took off from Chabahar Airfield and orbiting just a little too close to our convoy. We issued the required warnings to him over guard asking him to move. He came, came back and stated he was an Iranian aircraft over his own country. Of course, we responded saying we knew that, but if he failed to move, we might have to fire on him. After a long pause, he asked, where did we want him to go? And we said, hey, we'll give you vectors. And to our surprise, he took our vectors. Ernest Will Operations had 
escorted 136 convoys by the end of the war, a total of 270 tankers. Strangely enough, only 188 were actually reflag Kuwaiti tankers. Many of the ships would tag along, hoping for some sort of protection from our U.S. Navy escorts. U.S. Central Command recognized early on that the U.S. needed a much faster Gulf response to counter Iran's mining and bog hammer attacks. With Operation Prime Chance, they authorized the lease, leasing of two seafloat barges, basically commercial oil platforms, to be towed into position near Farsi Island in the Northern Gulf. Named Hercules and Windbrown, Navy SEAL teams were placed on board with Mark III patrol boats, Army AH-6 Little Birds, uh, which were helicopters, along with Stinger and communication detachments. In addition, MSO or U.S. minesweeping ships, RH-53 sea stallions, were moved into the Gulf for minesweeping operations. Speaking of mines, Iran started laying mines in the Persian Gulf in 1987. They had developed a new, simple, and effective naval mine called the Sadov-02. It was basically just a copy of an old Soviet World War II horned contact mine containing about 250 pounds of high explosives. Revolutionary guards would lay mines along the convoy routes at night, but technical issues often resulted in a few of the mines floating to the surface and making them visible to lookouts aboard our ships. Ship pictured here was the Iran Ajar, long suspected by the United States as a mine layer. On the night of 21 September, U.S. intelligence gets information that the Ajar was leaving port for possible mine laying operations. Two Army AH-6 Little Birds launched from two Navy warships and using night vision goggles, they found the Ajar laying mines. The guard on board opened fire on the helos, which returned fire with their mini guns and rockets, setting the Ajar on fire. It's about this time that the surviving guard members opted for a swim call jumping into the water. Next morning, U.S. Navy SEALs boarded the Ajar, picking up survivors, and they found 10 serialized mines still aboard. Iran had laid over 150 mines and damaging 10 ships by war's end. 14 April 1988, the USS Samuel B. Roberts, a Perry-class frigate, was on patrol in the Persian Gulf, Captain Paul Wren commanding. At about 16.30, lookouts aboard the Roberts spot dark objects ahead in the water. Captain orders all stop, and the Roberts find herself in the middle of a minefield. Captain orders the ship to general quarters, and while trying to back out of the minefield, she strikes a mine on her rear port quarter. The explosion broke, broke the Roberts keel, opened up a 25-foot breach below the waterline. Fires erupted on all four decks. The engine room and all ox machinery rooms are flooded. All the generators were lost, meaning no power for the pumps or the fire hoses. Roberts is basically on fire and sinking. Damage control crews worked frantically to staunch the leaks with whatever they could find. A single generator was finally brought back online and crew efforts managed to seal the hull breaches. With limited electrical power, the firefighting crews started attacking the fires. However, Captain Wren now has to order his crews to stop pumping water on the fires as the excess water is causing the ship to continue to sink. As more power comes back, the ship's pumps start handling the demand and firefighting resume. As if this was not enough, Captain Wren is now informed that the Iranian frigate Sabalon was five miles and closing fast. The Roberts and Sabalon had had several unfriendly encounters over the previous months. So despite a limited electrical power, Captain orders a missile on the rails and pointed towards the Sabalon, who finally turns away. What you're going to hear next is the captain addressing the crew over the 1MC four to five hours after striking the mine. Uh, improve the stability of our ship. The flooding is being pumped out at AMR 3. We found a hole in AMR 2. The engineers have shorted up. 
The rest of flooding has been controlled, and we are lighting the ship again. Keep your heads up. We're doing a good job. Help is on the way. There are two ships less than 70 miles from us right now coming at max speed. However, we've got to fight this problem ourselves. We don't know what the size of the minefield is. And I'm not really excited about having two ships come in and have the same thing happen to them as happened to us. We are presently still at General Quarter Stations, uh, more or less, and we need to stay that way. Let me be frank with you. Santa Lee Roberts is still in a lot of danger. And uh, depending on how serious our damage is, uh, we may have to abandon ship on very short notice. So stay on your toes. We're not out of the dark yet. 26 June, Roberts is placed aboard a sea lift ship. The mighty servant for transportation back to the United States for repairs. The final cost of those repairs was over $95 million. Estimated cost of the mine that she hit, about $1,500. If you're interested in reading more about the saving of the Samwood B. Roberts, there is an excellent book out titled No Higher Honor by Bradley Penniston. The U.S. declares the mining and damage to our ship a hostile act and plans a response. That response would be Operation Praying Mantis. The objectives, President Reagan wanted a proportional response. The U.S. would neutralize the three surveillance posts on the Sasan, Syria, and Rakish platforms. We were to find and sink an Iranian SOM class frigate. Planning started at Joint Task Force Middle East on 16 April, 88. Execution was to be two days later. U.S. surface forces were organized into surface action groups. SAG Bravo was the McCormick, Merrill, and Trenton. They were to attack the Sasan and Rakish platforms. SAG Bravo was the Wainwright, Simpson, and Bagley. They were to attack the Siri platform. SAG Delta was the Williams, Strauss, and O'Brien. They were to locate and sink an Iranian SOM frigate. USS Enterprise and Air Wing 11 were to provide airborne support. Additional, additional support came from Air Force AWACS, SEAL teams, Army Rangers, Marines, Army AH-6, and Marine Cobra Helos. This position of forces on the morning of 18 April, Battle Group Foxtrot was in the western Gulf of Oman. SAG units were located around their specific platforms. Enterprise first launch was to be before sunrise, Neon Station by 0800. It happened to be on the first E-2 Hawkeye launch along with four F-14s, two A-6s, and an E-A-6. Enterprise had a full war at sea strike package on alert on the deck. 0800, SAG Bravo gives radio warnings to evacuate the Sasan platform. Evacuate the platform immediately. I repeat, evacuate the immediately. Immediately. warnings, and at the end of that broadcast, the words, have a nice day, were added. This was the same radio call that Captain Nasty always closed with. I thought it was a pretty nice touch. Revolutionary Guards start pouring off the platform to the tugs below. Several stayed behind to man the 23 millimeter gun uh, on top of the platform and aiming it at the marrow. SAG Bravo commences the attack using deck guns with proximity fusing and knocking out the gun crew. Cobras and AH-6 helos provide covering fire for the H-46s to begin fast roping Marines onto the top of the platform. Marines set intel explosives, collect, I'm sorry, set explosives and collect intel. A little before 10 a.m., 1,500 pounds of high explosive go off as the platform becomes an inferno. SAG Bravo heads to the wreckage platform. Meanwhile, at the Siri platform, 0800, SAG Charlie issues warnings to evacuate the platform. People flood down to the tugs, but some guard members again man the 23 millimeter gun. 15 minutes later, SAG Charlie gun attack commences. An airburst round hits a gas tank, resulting in a large explosion and fire, which killed the gun crew. No seals were inserted as the platform was now in full flames. Just a little before 11 in the morning, SAG radar picks up an incoming surface contact. 
Simpson Hilo identified it as the Joshan, an Iranian command class patrol boat. Intel had previously reported that the Joshan was known to have the only operational harpoon missile uh, in Iran's inventory aboard her ship. Joshan was a well-armed Iranian patrol boat having anti-ship missiles, 40 millimeter machine guns, and a 76 millimeter deck gun. Commander Joint Task Force Middle East issues weapons free. SAG Charlie issues warnings. This is a warning. Stop and abandon ship. I intend to sink you. Over. CIC announces that they see radar separation returns indicating that the Joshan has just launched her harpoon missile. SAG fires off chaff. That harpoon passes close aboard the Wainwright's bridge. Sailors on the bridge report that they could feel the harpoon's exhaust as it passed by. Both Wainwright and Simpson fire SM-1s at the Joshan. Four missiles, four hits. Gunfire sinks the Joshan. Departing the Sasan platform, narrow radar detected an incoming surface contact. A Marine with Hilo was sent to ID the contact. Poor visibility in the area, hampered visual identification. Pilot reports only that it is an unknown combatant. Merrill preps her harpoons, broadcast warnings with no response. Cobra pilot is pressed for a better ID. He responds that the ship had three hull numbers on it. Merrill CEO remembers a similar ID several days before. He held fire but continues giving warning. No response. A few minutes later, this is what comes out of the haze. Yep, it's a Soviet. Sovremini class destroyer, whose captain finally answered the radio challenges. And when asked, what is he doing? He responded that they were just there to take pictures for history. Probably not understanding how close he just came to becoming part of history. Meanwhile, overhead the Straits are a moose. Signal intelligence in the E2 detected two Iranian F4s taking off from Bandar Abbas and heading towards our SAG units. Red and free and all Iranian air was given and our E-2 vectored two F-14s in for the attack. But the SAG commander calls off the F-14, stating he would take the targets with birds. F-14s returned to station, while the Wainwright fired two SM-1s at the Iranian aircraft, damaging one F-4. Both aircraft reversed course and returned to base. About 15 minutes later, our E-2 detected another aircraft taking off from Bandar Abbas and heading west. Red and free for all Iranian air is still in effect. However, the air contact was not headed towards any U.S. units. So the E-2 directed the F-4s to intercept the target for a VID for visual identification. On intercept, the F-14s report that the contact was an Iranian commercial airliner, apparently headed towards Oman, and quite possibly the very same airliner that was shot down four months later by the USS Vincennes. E2 now receives reports of a bog hammer attack near the Mubarak oil fields in the southern Persian Gulf and vectored two A6s into that location. A6s report seeing bog hammers attacking a U.S. tug in Bard. They request permission to attack. That request went up the chain of command direct to Colin Powell in the White House, who walked it into President Reagan's office. The president authorized the strike. That approval reached the cockpits of the A6s five minutes later. A6s dropped cluster bombs on a bog hammer, destroying one and damaging other. The rest flee. USS Gary, another Gary class frigate, was on patrol near the two mobile sea bases when she receives a report from Grey Ghost, an airborne AWACS, that two silkworm missiles had been fired towards her from the El Fa Peninsula. Silkworm was a Chinese-made anti-ship missile, if you're not familiar with it. It was big at over 65 feet long, traveled at 0.8 Mach, 65 feet above the water, had its own radar, and a 1,000-pound warhead. And it came with a pretty good punch. What you're going to hear next is one minute of audio from Gary CIC as she struggled to get fire control radar lock on those incoming missiles. A little hard to understand, happens fast. If you listen closely, you'll hear the range calls. Incoming missiles. At the start of the audio, 
both mobile sea bases have already started fire off chaff. They're launching chaff at this time. Come on, get water. You see this ready? See what you're going to fire on. Last one. 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 Last
Four months later, both Iraq and Iran entered, accepted a United Nations ceasefire resolution. That's the story of the Nighthawks, of VAW-117's participation in uh, Operation Praying Manus, America's one-day war with Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for that fantastic brief. Really interesting descriptions and uh, the accounts and the audio and the video were, were really fantastic. So thank you for bringing that to us. For those of you who are watching, we look forward to bringing more of these uh, types of presentations and stories from the VAW VRC community in the future. We hope you can join us. That's all for now. We're signing off. Have a good day.